Hello, I'm Samantha Ski, and I'm CEO of She Media. She Media is owned by Penske Media Corp. We were acquired in 2018, and we publish content. That's what we do. Um, we endeavor to inspire, educate, inform. We endeavor to challenge and to connect people, the 200 million people we serve as our audience every month. So I should start off with the, the admission that we are funded by advertisers. Advertisers are our lifeblood. They allow us to produce award-winning content. They allow us to curate some of the best diverse voices um, on the planet. They allow us to employ wonderful editors, journalists, and creatives. Uh, advertisers, again, are one of the core sources of revenue for our business. And we want them to do better. Not for us, but for the world. So activist advertising, which is what I'm speaking about, it's the close cousin of accountable advertising. Activist advertising is the hope that advertisers will use their power for good. Advertisers spend $600 billion in digital alone, digital advertising, a year globally. Of that, about $250 billion is spent in the US. That's a lot of investment and could do a lot of good in the world. So this is a quick history, one big image, I'll get out of the way, um, of advertising over the years. You could say it's media over the years, but advertising has, since the early 1900s, been the primary funder of media and of the content that we have come to rely on for our news, for our inspiration, our education, our entertainment. Um, advertisers have been there since pretty much day one, um, after cave paintings. They weren't there then, but every other media, pretty much since the early 1900s, has been funded by advertisers. So the reason we were able to broadcast horrific events, assassinations, inspiring events, competitions in tennis between men and women. Um, the reason that we have been able to push culture forward with diversity on covers of magazines and headlining sporting events and more and more entertainment properties is because we've had advertiser funding. And advertisers chose in many cases to use their power for good. They were always in friction with editorial. There were moments when advertisers did not want to fund things that, um, that newscasters wanted to say or that entertainers wanted to cover. Uh, there was friction around Billie Jean King's match um, in the Battle of the Sexes. There was friction early on when Venus and Serena Williams took the court and changed the game of tennis forever. Advertisers weren't sure that was the right association for some of them. Thankfully, creative won, sports won, and thus the consumers won. When we move on in the world of media and advertising, we begin to look into digital and the democratization, as we say, of content, social that allows everyone to be a producer and an editor, uh, social, has done lots of good. Uh, social is currently taking in 75 billion of those $250 billion of advertising being spent in the US. It's a lot of money that is no longer being pushed into the content and the material and the news and the editorial work that we've come to rely on. And it's doing other things, the social platforms are doing wonderful things as well. What's missing is any degree of accountability to accuracy to transparency, to respect, and those are things that I'm not sure we're willing to give up. When Mark Zuckerberg was brought before Congress, when he spoke to Senate, no advertisers were there. <laughs> advertisers are 97% of Facebook's revenue. While the media platform, the technology platform, the shareholders are fundamentally accountable to the choices that are made at any one of the social platforms, Twitter, 90% advertiser funded. Um, Facebook, as I said, over 97%.
Um, but advertisers didn't change their behaviors despite strong corporate statements about respect for accuracy and non-tolerance for fake news. But nothing really changed because algorithmic targeting is really effective in terms of selling ads. Algorithmic advertising also does not require an editor-in-chief. So the algorithm essentially becomes the editor-in-chief. The algorithm decides what you're going to consume every day. You guys all know this. We've banged on about this quite a bit, but we haven't managed to change the basic accountability for accuracy. Never mind accountability for kindness or productivity or thoughtful debate. Those are qualitative, straight up. We do not insist on facts, we don't insist on sourcing, and we don't insist that news, that, or that materials that's presented as news actually be factual. So the reason it's very hard to see any of this is because it is a walled garden, which everyone in advertising knows that term. It's way too gentle and sweet. Uh, it's a black box, is probably a little more accurate, but really it is a, a very dark cave. The data that's collected and that is used by advertisers and by Facebook to serve us whatever it is we are most likely to click, whatever rabbit hole we're most likely to go down, that's what's stored in there. And without transparency, advertisers cannot be held accountable to the content they're funding. That $600 billion is funding a lot of nefarious stuff. It's also funding some good but there's zero accountability to what portion. What portion of the dollars are funding disinformation and hatred? What portion are funding connection and grandparents looking at their, at their grandchildren? So without that degree, again, of accountability, we don't have any editorial direction. The algorithm, again, is the editor-in-chief. The media company, that is, receiving the same type of dollars that we receive, that NBC, CBS, the Atlantic, the local newspaper that's probably now out of business, we all are taking the same dollars or, or fighting for the same dollars. And again, more than a third are now going to social platforms. Because they don't employ editorial and because there's no accountability for veracity of truth, uh, it's a lot cheaper to produce advertising products uh, with the amount of data a social platform can collect and has very, very strategically collected since 2009, when we really kicked into super hyper-targeting. Um, the advertising is simply more effective in many cases. It's cheaper and it's more effective. And when you are a tech company, you can hide behind Section 230. You don't need to be held to the same standards as a media company. So when you're selling ads and selling hope, you're a media company. When you are endeavoring not to be accountable or to have any oversight, you're a tech company. And the social platforms choose to be both based on what suits them. Looking at the ad spending, this is an obvious one. The dollars have been moved away from what we call traditional media. Traditional media often comes with journalistic integrity. Um, social media, lots of product, productive stuff, but it does not come with the same expectations, the same history, the same expectations specifically of integrity and truth. So those dollars moving away make it that much harder for other types of media, for publishers, to remain healthy. 64% of all US digital spending is going to three companies. That's certainly a, a pretty stark portrait of putting the power in the hands of the few. Who's going out of business is my question. Which voices are being defunded? How is this dynamic essentially being held accountable for the defunding of journalism? Because the pie of spending isn't getting bigger, it's just getting smaller for those who report. This is what we've lost. I'll step back because it's super sad and you should see it, but uh, 2,200 local print newspapers have closed since 2005. Most of them are in underserved communities. Um, there are fewer than 1% black-owned media companies today. Less than 2% of ad spending goes to black-owned media companies. 
there might not be very many left if advertisers continue to spend only with the three players we just mentioned. That's what we call a downstream effect, and no one is accountable, despite the utter predictability of the outcome. 50% um, fewer American newspaper journalists, and again, newspapers are done. <laughs> Journalism takes, costs money. Journalism's expensive. So the co-conspirator with the algorithmic editor-in-chief, um, who is sadly defunding a lot of quality content, is the brand safety police. This one is pretty striking. So while advertisers who are running with social media have no obligation to fund truth, accuracy, fact-based content, they can say, I want to reach that individual, that consumer. I want her to be reached at a certain time of day. I know her insecurities because I've been watching everything she consumes. I can chart what she's going to buy. I know what she bought last time. I know how to pull her into a cycle of commerce that is essentially addictive. That's my postulate. Um, despite the known impact on Gen Z, on young women in particular, the issues around support, <laughs> re perpetuating body image issues, we continue to use the algorithm and the psychographics, the behavioral data, all of which shows the algorithm what you're most likely to go deep on. And sadly, we usually go deep on things we're angry about, stressed about, worried about, um, and that's useful. So brand safety, that brings me to brand safety. When reaching that individual consumer, you can say the words that you don't want your advertising to run adjacent to. So I don't want my ads to run next to certain words because those words might be upsetting. The ads I'm showing the individual user might also be upsetting, might be negative, uh, might produce negative issues on, in self-esteem, uh, might produce divisive thoughts and actions, might produce a storming of the capital. That's not my problem, but I'd like to be very clear as an advertiser that I don't want to run next to certain words. Certain words that are popping on every brand safety list right now that I've seen are as follows in no particular order. These are words that advertisers don't want to run next to. What happens to a word that is deprioritized by an advertiser that's not brand safe? Those words become less valuable, not just in terms of perception. They actually become less valuable in the open market of advertising impressions and advertising media. Because if no one is bidding in real time or buying, content that runs adjacent to uterus, then that impression is going to be worth much less. It's like any other commodity market. In choosing these words, I looked at many, many sources. This is from last week, um, but lots of sources. And these are the words I saw really often. Most block lists have thousands of words on them. So there's a lot of things that, you know, your average beauty advertiser or car automotive advertiser wants to stay away from. What really strikes me is the things they want to stay away from that are pretty fundamental to health, to racial justice, to reporting, by, again, staying away from those words, saying, I won't buy an ad impression that runs adjacent to content that uses these words. We are defunding that coverage. We're defunding that media. This is the kind of content I'd like to see us supporting. I think we can use that power that is right now being used to do as much targeting as possible and as narrow casted as possible, and that's treating safety as something that anything that inspires a reaction, whether the reaction is rage because you're reading an article about injustice or sadness because you're reading an article, a strongly reported article about the war in the Ukraine. All of those experiences are necessary. Health, vagina's always been a bad word. Most advertisers don't want to be associated with a vagina or a uterus, God forbid. There's some really important health information that has to reference those words. Reporting in the Ukraine costs a lot of money because you want to keep your reporters safe. It costs a lot of money because you're in a war zone, 
and because you want to present an unbiased view. That's a lot more expensive to produce than my photo of my cat, which is just as valuable, more valuable to the advertiser. He or she would much rather run next to my, I don't have a cat, but I have like a dog. So they would much rather run next to a photo of my dog or my child than they would next to the words Black Lives Matter or Ukraine. I think it's a little bit of a problem that there's no transparency around block lists. There's no transparency around the content that's actually served and funded by advertisers and activist advertising to get into the happy part of the discussion. Um, Adrian, raise your hand. <laughs> I brought with me one of the top women, or I asked her, I invited her and she agreed to come. Uh, top women football players, American football players. And <laughs> woo! <laughs> and my, my suggestion is that we say we like sports because they're gritty, they're competitive, they're dramatic. These are all the reasons that people convene, used to on a Sunday to watch sports together. They pass along amazing metaphors to our kids. Um, and yet women's sports are not viewed um, as often as men. And that's not because we're all a bunch of sexist jerks. It's because men's sports, we are, but, <laughs> but um, it's because men's sports have a legacy. Hundreds of years of generations sitting down together. Title IX is relatively recent. And we've just started to get the opportunity to put amazing women athletes in front of a huge audience and activist advertising may require the advertiser who wants the cheapest ad unit, which means the biggest audience, the most uh, targeted ad unit, um, those advertisers could also go ahead and put an ad next to Adrian, <laughs> next to the unbelievable women's leagues and sports teams who are changing the world and recognize we're not asking you to do it as a handout. We're asking you to do it because it's really engaging, entertaining content. And the cycle will, perpetu will continue to perpetuate of not enough viewers, so not enough ad dollars, so not a lot of media coverage, so not enough viewers. That cycle will perpetuate itself. So we can't fix the inequity in media funding, advertiser funding of media and of sports specifically, if we don't all engage and say, this is the best content. If we don't allow the people who play the sport, who are ballers, we don't allow them to show us that baller instinct, uh, that activity. These are gritty players. So my ask of activist advertisers is that instead of just funding the world that it already exists and going for the most targeted individual in the most insecure spot next to God knows what content, Instead, think about the world you want to see, that you claim you want to see in every corporate statement out there. Be the company you are in a press release and think about the content you could make possible if you just decided to take a minute of friction and allow yourself to invest in the future. That's my ask. <laughs>